Welcome back for our uh, lunchtime speakers. We have uh, two uh, spectacular, well, actually three speakers, but two, two parts to this. And uh, we're really delighted to uh, have um, Carlotta Mass uh, from New Hope and Nick McCoy from some firm, I can't remember the name, from Whipstitch Whip Capital <laughs> and Don Clark from Whole Foods joining us. Um, were you three able to attend any of the morning? Yes. No, unfortunately, not, I was not. not. Okay. All right. Well, we've had an awesome day so far. The questions are, have been flying, and I know we're going to have plenty uh, for you as we get going uh, in the afternoon session. So uh, we will have uh, Carlotta and Nick are going to begin with some uh, state of the natural organic marketplace insights and trends, and then. Uh, we will uh, see if there's time for brief questions. Uh, we will then pivot to Don. Uh, and then of course, we hope that there'll be time for everybody uh, uh, all together. And uh, let me just remind everybody, uh, stay on the chat all day. You'll see the background on our speakers, uh, which allows me to give a much shorter introduction, which is simply to say thank you, Carlotta and uh, Nick for joining us and both of you for being sponsors as well. So I turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary. And congrats on pulling this together and the attendance that you've had you have and um, it's just really impressive what you are bringing to the community and I feel really privileged to be part of it and to have the opportunity to again present with Nick McCoy. We've been doing a little bit of a roadshow um, presenting together on the state of the industry and we created something new and special for um, the Hirschberg Entrepreneur Institute. And what we're gonna dig into today are four dimensions of what could become a new normal for natural and organic entrepreneurs based on you know, some of the longer term changes that we may see in consumer attitudes and behaviors and just how the world um, may be working post COVID. So um, we can switch to the next slide. And next slide, that's just me and Nick. Um, so yeah, Nick's gonna kick it off and start talking about looking at the how categories and channels are shifting and how some of this is really good news for natural. Great, th thank you, Carlotta. And thank you, Gary, for pulling all this together. This is a, this is a major undertaking. I know a lot of work has gone into you know, putting this together in a short time frame. Um, next slide, please. So, We've been getting a lot of questions uh, at Whipstitch here about what is the new normal and what's kind of going on month by month um, because you know the data is all over the place and and uh, there's all kinds of mixed messages and, and mixed results uh, across different categories and different companies. So we fired up the spins account and we took a look at what's going on by channel to try to get some insight into this. And when we actually, what we did is we took the Mulo channel and we looked at um, Mulo versus natural versus convenience for the February quad, the March quad, and the April quad. Uh, that's a quad is a four week period. And so indexing to February, March was up 42% in natural, 35% Mulo, and a little bit in convenience. Convenience was heavily weighted by beer, um, as, as people might expect. April, as a lot of people experienced, has been a little bit of a pullback, but it's still 21% above in natural and 15 in Mulo. And I think it's significant that natural is over-indexing Mulo and continues to do so as people are going through this because that, that's indicating that people are actually eating healthier. It's also interesting to note, and this is not in the deck, but I had to run this afterward because somebody asked me the question. Um, we took a look at private label across the entire universe of spins just to see what was going on in February and March. And I was actually really surprised to see that the difference between the way private label indexed to February in both March and April was less than a half a point, and it was actually to the negative. So brands are actually being very, very slightly bought more than normally compared to private label. So that indicates that people are not trading down to private label for price, which is reflective here in going to natural enhance too. Slide please. This slide here just basically shows the same thing broken down into some relevant categories for the pitch presenters tomorrow with a couple others thrown in. Um, and you can see the story is pretty consistent. March is up, April down a little bit. Flour obviously is a standout. We left that in there so people could see that's still holding strong as everybody's baking. And hair care on the right is, is a little bit down as you know, some certain, certain uh, 
certain categories that are, are you know, already stockpiled in slower use are a little bit down in April. Slide, please. <clears throat> so one question that we've gotten a lot is, if restaurant sales go down after this or for a period of time, what does that translate to in terms of branded product sales and retail? And it's a really hard question because the markup in retail is very different than the markup in restaurant. So I have to thank my team because we came up with an ingenious way to at least proxy this. We found data um, that supported that 34% of calories are consumed at restaurants and the other 66 from retail. So if retail and restaurant are about the same monthly expenditure, doing the math, a restaurant calorie costs about twice as much as a retail calorie. And from this, you can deduce that of the spike in retail sales, the monthly spike there, roughly half is pantry loading and roughly half is a shift from restaurant. So going forward, if, you know, like China and other countries, as they're going back into normal, there is a decline in food service and restaurant, you know, of say 20% or 30%, that would theoretically, you know, according to this, translate into a 10 or 15%, you know, quasi permanent or lift as long as that food service is down in retail sales. And that's really good news for branded products. Slide. Uh, Nick, let me just pause for one second because questions are coming in. Uh, we, we're, we're going to put these uh, slides up on the site, right? Yes. Okay, so everybody uh, who's panicking here because you have 800 questions each comment is made, it's all gonna be there. So um, you'll, you'll be able to download it. Yeah, thanks Gary, I should have said we, um, there, is some ex there is a lot of detail here. I know for kind of high level slides that are going quickly, uh, some of this is intended to be leave behind so people can see it afterward. Right. Thank you. Um, when, there's definitely an opportunity for healthy eating at home. One thing that was also in this data, which was really surprising to me, is they had the restaurant uh, calorie consumption by macronutrient too. And as you can see here, the macronutrient profile of restaurants is not significantly different than the macronutrient profile of what people are, are eating at home. Um, and you know, a lot of people would think that people are eating much fattier or you know, carb heavy foods at restaurants. And that's really not the truth. There's, there's a slight difference, but not that much. Slide, please. Um, in thinking about the, what is the opportunity for brands going forward if we do have more consumers buying at retail um, that are trading over dollars from restaurant? You know, there's a very fertile ground here in the millennials and the Gen Z, basically, particularly males uh, up to about age 39 in the purchasing population and females up to about age 30. And, and these are consumers right now that are very heavily buying food services, you can see here, food service and restaurant. And because they're younger and they're going to be buying for a long time in their lives, to the extent that these consumers now move over to retail uh, and, you know, and buying more branded products, then that's gonna benefit us also as a rising tide in the long term, because these are people that weren't showing up in stores in great quantities before. Slide, please. So another question that we get a lot is, you know, right now, what's going on in the investment community? And one thing that we've heard from all investors is there is some uncertainty. And remember, investors think about risk and they think about return. And during times like this, they probably lean a little heavier into looking at risk because the return that they need to get is pretty fixed. So to try to sort out that risk and de-risk your conversations to investors, what you want to do is you want to get as much velocity data to establish what your baseline today is. Because at the end of the day, an investor is underwriting your investment based on what they think that they're going to sell their shares or their, you know, their securities for when you get liquid one day. And to figure out what that projection looks like, you have to start from a baseline. And if the baseline is uncertain, then it gets even more difficult and more risky to make a bet that you're going to get from X to Y to get to that, you know, that underwriting exit. Um, so, you know, sell through data is still very good and always start there. But now, instead of just looking at your own velocity, compare yourself to the category, generally speaking, the entire category. Compare yourself to the category in health and wellness or the HWI in SPINs or um, NPI universes. NPI is the purest of the uh, healthy foods and HWI is about three times the size and it's kind of in between TPL, which is everything. So if you compare to those things, those are great data points. Compare yourself to other BFY brands both large and small, and see how you're doing versus them month to month. It's very good data. Look at Whole Foods Portal, you know, weekly retailer point of sale data. 
distributor inventory if you have things like UNFI Clearview. Um, and then of course, online and D2C, there's, there's lots of data there. The more data and the more you know, triangulation that you can get there, anecdotal evidence, you know, the more you de-risk your investment. And that's really important right now. Slide, please. And now I'm gonna to pass to Carlotta. Great, thanks so much, Nick. Yeah, so another dimension of this new normal that we believe um, we may see after, after COVID is that health and wellness is going to matter even more to people and it's going to matter to everyone. But right now we as an industry don't currently serve everyone. The next slide. Um, go back to the, the previous slide. Yes, thank you. So yes, you know, a, there've been a lot of consumer, consumer surveys that have been conducted in the past few weeks. Um, New Hope has been con conducting some of these surveys and a lot of them are pointing to the fact that health matters more than ever to consumers um, in this COVID crisis. And it makes a ton of sense because if you turn on the news or read the newspaper or you know, read news in your social media, you're hearing over and over that people with underlying health conditions and often lifestyle and diet related health conditions like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, that these people are having a much harder time managing COVID and also surviving COVID. And it's really reinforcing how important health is. We surveyed a thousand consumers the a week of April 13th, and these were consumers that were representative of the US population ages 18 to 65. And what we found is that 77% of the consumers we surveyed say that personal health is more important today than it was in 2019. Mm. We also asked about environmental health and we found that 67% um, thought environmental health was more important today than last year. And I share that because it will set up some of the data that Nick will be sharing um, shortly. Next slide. I, I think, can I just pause and just underscore what Carlotta just said, uh, because I just think it's so important. This is this is not natural foods only consumers. This is no. U.S. consumers. So really important for everybody here. Yes, and and when then when you dig in more to actually what behaviors are consumers actually prioritizing as part of their efforts to um, take better care of themselves, uh, they said these were the the behaviors that we asked about. But they said eating healthy food. Forty three percent were were saying that that's more important today than it was a year ago. Um, taking dietary supplements and vitamins, which are important products in the natural products industry, 33% said more important. Um, so I think that's important in terms of how consumers are looking at eating healthy and natural products as important behaviors for taking better care of themselves. Next slide. And so that brings me to the question you know, we as an industry, we, we've always been at our core rooted in health and wellness. And if you are in the food and beverage space, especially, I think you need to be asking yourself right now, do my products deliver real nutrition? Am I really supporting health and wellness with my offerings? Or do my offerings, are they loaded with sugar? Are they loaded with sodium? Are they loaded with, you know, highly processed ingredients or, um, you know, too much unhealthy fat. And so I think it's important for us to be looking at as an industry, could we be doing more? And as individual companies, could we be doing more to deliver better nutrition? And, and these are just a couple of brands that I think really have at the core of their mission to bring better nutrition to consumers. Good Food for Good is one of my very favorites. No sugar added in their condiments or cooking sauces. Lower sodium compared to most of these products. Um, Beyond Broth, I know they've participated in the Hirschberg Institute before, but very low sodium compared to a lot of products out there that would be in similar categories, which are so high in sodium. Also packed with science-backed herbs to support wellness. And finally, I wanted to call out a dozen cousins because not only are they trying to bring more nutrient um, rich, lower sodium um, 
products to, to the market, but they're doing it in a way to make those products both economically accessible and culturally relevant to everybody in this country, regardless of who, the, who they are, where they live, or how much money they make. And that gets me to my next slide and the point, um, another new reality that I think is really facing our industry and, and could be an amazing opportunity is that this country is becoming increasingly diverse. U.S. Census data shows us right now that the, the country is made up of about 60% um, white Americans, non-Hispanic Latino Americans, but we're quickly moving toward a white minority. Um, research shows that we'll be white consumers will be the minority within 25 years. And so it leads me to the question, do we have the leadership, the diverse leadership in this industry to really successfully serve this increasingly diverse population. Next slide. And that gets to some research that New Hope conducted with the New Jedi Collaborative. Just to find out the answer to this question, we conducted a survey last in the fourth quarter of 2019, and we were able to have 220 companies in our industry Complete Carlotta, this you should just explain Jedi to folks who don't know it. Oh, yes. So Jedi is, is um, a new a nonprofit organization. Jedi stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And it's very similar to the Climate Collaborative in that um, you can make commitments um, and re receive access to resources that will help you bring greater justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion to your organizations and to the industry at large. And so, uh, you know, a starting point for us with this organization was to just find out what is the demographic makeup of our leadership in this industry. And it wasn't surprising, but it really reinforced, this survey reinforced that the vast majority of CEOs and C-suite leaders uh, um, and also board members in our industry are predominantly white and then also predominantly male. So next slide. The statistics look a little bit better in terms of diversity when it comes to smaller companies. So the, the, um, the blue bar on, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that those are companies with fewer than 10 employees. And when it comes to engaging women leaders, either in team leadership or um, board leadership, these smaller companies are doing a better job than the mid-size and large companies. Next slide. These companies, these smaller companies are also doing a better job when it comes to engaging people of color in um, team leadership and board leadership. Next slide. And so right now in the natural products industry, obviously 2020 is a completely different year, but our research showed that in 2019, industry was um, growth was beginning to slow in our industry last year. And so I really believe that if we could bring about more diversity and inclusion in our industry, that would be an amazing tool for generating stronger growth moving forward because it would enable us to better serve this increasingly diverse um, populace in our country, but even more importantly, allow us to bring our better for you, healthier um, products to every consumer in this country. Um, next slide. And so this is just a little bit more about the Jedi Collaborative. Check us out. And next slide, and I will turn it over to Nick. Thank you, Carlotta. Um, yeah, that, those, are, those are really good points, Carlotta. And, you know, in thinking about how our population in our country is going to become, you know, more diverse over time, having the board composition and the management composition that matches the customer base, you know, more closely is really, really helpful in, you know, in finding more demand pockets, you know, within the demographics. So I think those are great points. Next slide, please. Um, sustainability is a long-term brand investment. And um, I think Stonyfield is one of the best examples of that uh, for many reasons, one of which is it started in 1983, which it, you know, was a time when organic was very, very nascent. It authentically embraced it early on. You know, to put it in perspective, in 1990 was about when we hit a billion in organic sales in the US. Whole Foods is a driver of organic. They only had 12 stores in 1991. And our agriculture policy then was really you know, focused on single crop quantity within farms and not necessarily going to organic. Europe was really a leader at that time. 
So you know, at the time, this was this was really kind of a crazy idea to go out with a mainstream product like a yogurt, which you know is is a very good product, um, and have it be organic when nobody else, well, not nobody else, but so many people weren't. And if you think about today, and you're thinking about your brand long term, Stonyfield is because they did that is always going to be associated with organic. Nobody's ever going to think of them differently, and you know, and and be, nobody's ever going to doubt that their brand ethos was that. The earlier that you can put sustainability into your supply chain, whether it's in packaging or you know in regenerative agriculture or organic or you know whatever whatever fits for your product, the more that that's going to be an investment in the long term of your brand. Um, next slide, please. Regenerative agriculture is is a little bit complicated, but in many ways this is kind of like an organic 2.0. Uh, it's a long term brand sustainability investment with many winners. The population is growing. It's going to be over 10 billion uh, by 2060, and we're going to have to feed all these people. That means we're going to have to take care of our soil. And I think, like organic, the consumer is, is driving, you know, the move toward regenerative agriculture and sustainable packaging too. Um, the U.S. has an advantage here. We have significant arable land investments. We've got about 11 and a half percent of the world's arable land, and we're projected to have four percent of the population in uh, 2100 going forward. So when you do the math on that we have the potential to be the largest food exporter in the world. And trade balance is something that everybody embraces. Um, regenerative agriculture improves crop yields. So if we can make that soil even more productive and take care of it, it's gonna put us and our population in the world in a better position. And that's gonna reflect very well on your brand going forward in 2025 or 2030, when you're looking to exit or get funding along the way. Next slide, please. back. Um, and thinking about, you know, how, how do you kind of pay or how do you, where do you find the money to invest in things like sustainability? Well, the traditionally young brands, you know, have, a, have customers that are looking for the product and the fast way to get them is trade spend. It's the first thing you do. And it makes a lot of sense. It, it draws attention to your brand and you build up a customer base. But as you, as you get further out into, you know, retail and you, you extend your products into more stores, you have to start to find new customers that are beyond you know, that kind of low hanging fruit. And that's what large companies are very, very good at. They're very good at finding those pockets of demand and figuring out how to market to them. That marketing is much more of a long-term proposition, just like an investment in sustainability. Trade spend, except for, the, you know, except for customers that you're going to get and retain as part of it, is generally speaking short-term. It's a single purchase. So the balance of that short-term and long-term in your marketing budget is very important in, in keeping your velocity as you grow your, your retail presence. If we look at our industry, you know, the New Hope numbers show about $250 billion of natural product sales, assuming a 50 markup uh, for retail and a 20% trade spend, there's $24 billion, at least 20 billion of trade spend out there. If we can just cut, de uh, cut the uh, discounts a little bit and balance it a little bit more on the left side of the fulcrum there, um, that's, gonna, uh, that's gonna benefit everybody in the long term. Next slide, please. And now I pass to Carlotta. Thanks, Nick. I'm so glad to have a presentation partner who always does the math. That's why I love, I love presenting with Nick. Um, so for our final dimension of the new normal that I wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about is all about trust and, and what might the world look like um, as we get out of COVID and, and what might we be able to do as an industry to create a better world than the one we went into this whole mess with. Next slide. So at New Hope, we've been doing these uh, consumer surveys with our partner, Susie, to just try to uh, figure out how, how consumers are thinking about different questions right now. And one of the things we wanted to know about is trust. Who are consumers trusting right now? And so uh, a survey that we conducted last week showed that when it comes to knowing who to trust for information on how to protect yourself and keep your family and, and your loved ones safe, right now consumers are really divided in who they're, whom they're trusting. You know, state government um, is being deemed more trustworthy than, of course, um, city government, local government, and, and also um, federal government for sure. And that really across the board, you know, there's a good number of people who don't trust any of these, um, you know, parts of our government for good information. Next slide. 
So it really shows there's a lack of trust. And when we start asking questions about trust in our food system, who do you trust to keep the food system running and to ensure that, that you're going to have access to the, the food you need to feed yourself and your families? Um, not surprisingly, the majority of consumers are saying that they char right now they're trusting the large food companies. They're trusting, you know, um, the Nestle's, the General Mills, the, the companies, those brands that they've, they've known for a long time and that they believe have the um, foundation and the stability to keep the food system running. And that's not surprising given a lot of the shortages to our, you know, to the, that we've seen on the food front due to pantry loading and major disruptions in our supply chain. But it also brings up a lot of questions for even if you are a smaller company, what can you be doing right now to engender more trust with your consumers? Next slide. Got about four minutes, Carlotta. Great. Um, so these are just a few examples of, of brands that are, you know, um, some of them pretty established and others newer in our, our industry that are really going above and beyond in what they're doing to engender trust with consumers and then using those actions as a way via their social media and other marketing to really get the word out about what they're doing. And I think um, be able to paint a, a story for consumers that these are brands that are stepping up as servant leaders to, to this in the situation that we're all in with COVID. Next slide. And so the last couple of points I wanted to make um, are related to also collaboration and how we work together. I've been um, on a number of these events and I always try to bring up the idea of collaboration. This is a, this is a topic that I've, I've felt is important for our industry to be looking at how we work together um, to solve big challenges, to pursue big opportunities, and that we can do more together than we can do alone. And I think this Hirschberg Institute is a great example of coming together to do more together. And these are just a few of the many organizations out there, the Naturally Network, Climate Collaborative, Jedi Collaborative, OSC2, Grow North in Minnesota, that are amazing places for you to find um, other people who you could collaborate with. So I'd encourage you to be thinking about who can help you um, with your own problems and also um, just do more together. Should, should you like. Um, next slide. Yeah. And then so, so finally, we were inspired to just understand how consumers are thinking about what life will be like um, and what they'd like to see after we get out of COVID, inspired by some of you may have seen the um, the, the great realization video that's been going around social from Tom Foolery. And so we asked consumers, you know, how they're feeling about this. And what we found is that more people feel united and motivated to build a fair, more compassionate world um, after all of this is over than those who feel the opposite. So when we asked this question of, do you feel more united or more divided? we found that there were more people who felt united and stronger. Um, certainly a lot of people in the middle, but that, that, that gives me a lot of hope for what we can do all together after this is over. And as a final slide, one more, one more shift. Um, when we were asked, you know, are you motivated to re restart things exactly as they were before all of this happened? Or are you really motivated to lean in toward building a fairer and more compassionate world? It was wonderful to see that more people, a lot more people are, are looking at how they might be motivated to build a fair and more compassionate world. And I think that that really speaks to what our industry is about. And I hope that we can all work together to do just that. Thank you. Wow. Wow, you two. Um, honestly, we have more, far more questions than can possibly be answered, especially because we have another amazing speaker about to join us. A uh, couple of quickies though, uh, VFI brands. I think that was you, Nick. Someone's asking to define VFI brands. VFI brands. Uh, which slide was that on? I'm, I'm not sure. To... It goes way back. So uh, it's all right. You know, what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, ask you to, we're going to get you the questions and you can, um, you know, get, get back to these folks. But there is one question that I thought, oh, um, Carlotta, folks are wondering about uh, any insights into how New Hope's thinking about uh, Expo East. 
Yeah, I saw that question come up. Um, obviously, we don't have a lot of time to answer that because it's a complex question. Um, but we're at this point moving forward with all of our plans for Expo East. A lot of the planning is going into what, what it would take to bring all of the, the needed health and safety measures into place for an event of, of that size. We've, we've, been, we've had a lot of interest um, in Expo East, a lot of companies sign up that might not typically attend. And so I think there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm in the industry, but for us, first and foremost, is health and safety of the, of, of the community, our, our you know, um, colleagues. And so that's what we're focused on. We're, we'll be putting out um, more information in the next week or so. Um, and then also looking to host an event where we can answer a lot of questions and just provide a lot more detail and insights on what those health and safety measures can be. And we will be um, very much out front of a decision on this um, in the next coming weeks and you know, month as, as we know everybody is really um, eager and anxious to, to know what, what might happen in September. Great. Well, listen, I think ahead, VFI, I think is BFY, I probably oh, BFY said, better which for is you, better, better for you. Yes. Yeah, better for you. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. I, I didn't know what it was. Either. No, okay. I, saw, I saw the question come in that way too. Okay. Trying to figure it out. Yeah. Listen, uh, honestly, first, thank you. Incredibly jam packed with data, but, and, and, but also thank you for the blast of optimism because I couldn't agree with you more. And there are some really important questions about organic trends here and a much longer discussion that needs to be have, had about regenerative. And it gives me a good opportunity to say that we have plenty of our Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute webinars up and coming. And we might think about getting you both on for a little bit more of a discussion opportunity with folks than time is allowing today. I, I, I said at the very, very beginning, and this is by way of introducing you, Don, um, you know, folks should just hold on to their hats today because uh, we're jamming. Uh, we've got 15 different time zones. We have 500 people, um, a lot lot to cover, and uh, a lot of really, really good questions. But uh, Carlotta and Nick will take a look at the questions uh, and see if they can get back to you. Uh, thank you both. And now uh, let me just welcome Don Clark, Whole Foods. And uh, in the interest of hearing from you and not from me, Don, I'm gonna spare the introduction. I just ask you to take it, take it away. Great, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you fine. Awesome, and again, thanks Carlotta and thanks uh... Uh, Nick, that was great, great content. Um, and thanks, Gary. Uh, everybody, I'm Don Clark. I was going to say good morning and good afternoon and good evening because I'm sure all those time zones are covered and, and excited to be here to be part of the discussion throughout the day. It's been a fascinating um, uh, morning and early afternoon so far. Um, in my conversations with uh, Gary as we were getting ready for this, he asked me to provide just some overall pointers of best ways to build uh, relationships and maintain relationships with Whole Foods. How do I and how do we feel about uh, suppliers who uh, then sell to our competitors? And then just what are some just tangible uh, pointers that, uh, that I can provide that help you to approach this. And so um, just a quick intro, I'm the Senior Vice President of of merchandising uh, specifically with responsibility for non-perishables, but I also lead our private label business. We have two companies that report to me, one the Starkey that does our, our, our natural springs water in Idaho and Allegro, our coffee business in Colorado, and then our merchandise operations and merchandise and data and analytics. So a lot, a lot in that. Um, uh, excited to be here, uh, excited for the last four and a half years I've had at Whole Foods uh, to lead a lot of the changes that we have been um, going through um, and grateful for people like Gary, Walter, and others who've been on this call who've been great mentors uh, along the way. Um, so I'm just going to share, if you want to jump to slide two, just a, a few basic things that you need to know uh, if you're looking to partner with us. So if you can jump to the third slide, next one, Antonio. Um, there you go. So as a company, it, oh, sorry, go back one. As a company, we've been stubborn, uh, and this is important to understand about Whole Foods, about our standards from day one. And so while we sell the highest quality natural and organic foods, we're consistently aiming to advance the way that products are raised, grown, and produced, um, including being at the forefront of movements like we just heard a minute ago on regenerative agriculture. Um, that's why we take pride in what we uh, sell, even more so than what we don't sell. Um, and our, our unparalleled quality standards ensure that products that we sell meet 
uh, a higher standard, one that bans more than 400 ingredients commonly found in other stores, as well as numerous manufacturing, farming, fishing, and ranching practices that we just don't believe measure up to the standards that we have. Um, in addition to our, what we call our unacceptable food list and ingredient list uh, and continuous certifications as the first and only certified organic national grocer, we have rigorous standards in things like our animal welfare for meat. Uh, we're proud about what we have when it comes to our standards for laying hands, for seafood, for supplements, for beauty, for sunscreen, for cleaning products in so many different areas of our stores where we think we have led uh, the industry. And so brands that that share our passion for this kind of advancement um, and who strive to do good for the environment, for the community, uh, resonate more deeply with Whole Foods Market customers than brands that, do, that don't. And these brands provide meaningful innovation and are able to successfully connect with our customers when telling particularly their stories, co-creating win-win partnerships and really delighting our customers. And so the vision, one of our merchandising vision is really to enable our team members, our suppliers and our customers to truly change the world. We, we feel that we're the canvas for that. Uh, and it guides our strategy, our initiative prioritization and the decisions that our team takes every single day. Uh, next slide, Antonio. So let's, let's talk about how uh, to build and maintain uh, relationships with each other. So next slide. When working with this, it's also helpful to understand that our merchandising structure is pretty much as unique as our rigorous standards are. Uh, we leverage our global team to manage products that we now assort across all, our, all of our stores. But we also have 11 regional teams that their role is really to contribute to and add into the assortment of products that are locally relevant, regionally relevant, um, all the way down to a metro. Many of the brands that we uh, launch, uh, some of you uh, who I've seen on this call, started literally in a single store. Um, in many ways, this makes us nimble. Uh, we're able to give all of our customers a mix of similar and unique shopping experiences across all of our stores while staying very locally uh, and regionally relevant uh, to our customers. Having a slight- Your experience that your internal- um, that's, Sorry, Don, I was going to say, yeah, you might want to cut off your camera because we're having a slight slowdown on your Video? internet. Video? Yeah. Maybe just go okay. to audio for a few. I'll do that. Thanks. How's that? Perfect. Okay. So your experience with our team will start first and foremost with your strategy and your strategy. And Gary, jump in if you still can't hear me. And if no, necessary, you're good. Can, All good. Thanks. Call in on the phone. Yeah. Um, if you're looking to sell enterprise-wide, uh, uh, and, and in all of our stores, then you'll start with our global team. Um, and our global team will then guide you in how to launch your brand in our stores. And if necessary, whether we think instead of a national launch, it really should be more of a regional launch. The global team will play the role of connecting you to the right region if you start first and foremost with global, but the team feels it should be more of a regional or a smaller start. Uh, it's often wise, even though it's great to start big and to start with all stores, it's often wise to prove out your business model, prove out your ability to run and manufacture and so forth at a much smaller level. And so oftentimes we recommend that you start with our regional teams going directly into the region that you're uh, manufacturing your product. Local is a really big deal. And so that's an important way to start. And our region teams will guide you and, and, and then where necessary connect you into either more regions or into the global team. We know that if you're already doing business, you might be used to starting with a single point of entry into a retailer. And so for us, that might seem a little bit more complex, but what we've been able to do over the last several years is really streamline that process so that our teams, whether it be a regional merchant or a global merchant are super well connected. We're reading the data together. We're talking about those trends on a regular basis and connecting small brands that may have a small startup at the region into our global teams where we see the need to begin to expand that. And our, and our team members are super passionate about many facets, particularly of production, of product quality, from how something is grown or how it is raised, to how it tastes or feels, to what packaging it comes in, to the impact it has in our communities, you name it. And we spend a lot of time, and our team spend a lot of time growing their expertise, talking to one another, making recommendations, and ensuring that our customers are gonna get the very best experience in our stores. Can you go to the next slide? So let's talk about 
um, a innovation assortment strategy. We believe we have a pretty clear innovation and assortment strategy. And so let's go to the next slide that has the details. So as we look for who we partner with, we look for authentic industry leaders and products that will meet our quality standards and win with our customers. Um, our customers keep us really on our toes. They're constantly seeking out new experiences and we're committed to bringing exactly that to them day in and day out. And so brands that know this, that come with that perspective in mind and then tailor their channel and their assortment strategies to hope these market customer needs are the customer needs are those that really succeed, uh, succeed in our shelves. And I can't emphasize that enough that as you develop a strategy, you need to have a channel strategy and an assortment strategy within those channels. I thought I'd also spend a bit of time talking about what our team looks for um, in brands or products before giving you some tactical advice on approaching our merchant teams. So we're looking for brands, products that really align with our mission and our core values. It's brands that fit our ethos that are the ones that our customers expect and it's ones that our customers reward. Our merchants are always looking for the latest products that really inspire our customers. When you heard Carlotta talk about wellness, we lean heavily in on wellness and brands that really inspire our customers to lean in on wellness as well. The best brands at Whole Foods Market share our core values like some of the highest quality natural and organic ingredients and caring for the community and for the environment. Um, and they're authentic brands, often driven by a founder with a passion or vision to perform better over time. And I can't emphasize that enough. It's not uncommon that we have a large company who will develop a brand uh, a large CPG uh, and develop an organic brand and come and say, we need to launch this at Whole Foods. And the answer typically is no, um, because our customers are passionate, even um, uh, when the brand gets acquired, they're passionate about their original story. They're passionate about the founder story. Um, and that's meaningful to them. Um, there are also brands that meet our customers where they are, which is again, our customers are ahead of trend uh, and they want meaningful innovation. And so we know the early adoption of trends innovation leads to really loyal and obsessed customers. And we have many super, super loyal and obsessed customers. Even during COVID, it is amazing the loyalty that we've seen in our core customer that really drives the lion's share of our business that is very mission aligned to Whole Foods. Um, our customers are adventurous. They love looking for new products and trying new products. And they're willing to try new things from unfamiliar suppliers, as well as brands they love. And so we balance onboarding new suppliers with bringing in impactful line extensions from familiar brands every single day. Our customers are more engaged in trends from wellness and special diets to beauty and more. And they're very aware of what they're putting in and on their bodies. And they also are quick to identify claims and practices that give them a false impression of really how sustainable, local, or progressive a brand may be. Our, our customers typically cannot be fooled. And so you better stand for what you really say you're standing for. So we seek out products that are leading the trend curve in line with our standards and transparent about their environmental stewardship or social responsibility. And this ensures that we're onboarding innovation that values, that drives value to the category and to the customer experience while also walking our talk um, of our mission and our values from end to end. And so it's so important that when you're approaching our teams um, and, and that when you know what you have to offer our customers in trend innovation, that we're gonna wanna talk to you about your strengths and we're going to want to talk to you about your strategies. It, it, it's, it's not, uh, if it, you can't come to Whole Foods and say, I have this great idea, now help me do all the work. You have to come with a really firm idea of what is your strategy? Again, what is your channel strategy? And how do you want to go to business? And so what are the metrics you're using to measure your own success? You know, we're going to consider data from internal and external sources. You heard in the earlier calls, Walter talking a lot about Nielsen and other kinds of data. Know the marketplace. Know how the business is performing. Know how other products are performing in the category that you're trying to launch in. You know, what percentage of the sales of the category and growth are coming from within the category? How do you plot out incremental next steps to create wins for everybody? We're going to want to talk, as I mentioned, about your channel strategy, which means, again, um, how you go into the natural organic channel may be very different than how you go into club and very different than how you go into mass and very different than how you go into grocery. And it should be, you shouldn't have a one size fits all strategy. Um, we have brands we've helped launch, make it into other conventional retailers. And one of the questions Gary asked, is that okay? And the answer is absolutely. We applaud the fact that when we launch a brand, uh, in fact, we think the measure of success is not keeping it bottled at Whole Foods, but if we can make more and more consumers to, to embrace these purpose-driven brands, that's a win for you, a win for customers, a win for Whole Foods. But when you do, um, we want to see you again have a meaningful channel strategy. 
We want to continue to ensure that we're leading uh, in innovation. So our ask of you is uh, typically to say, hey, lead with us first, launch with us first. And that might even include asking uh, for exclusives for a period of time and so forth. And oftentimes you'll see that our merchants will sit down with you and help you to develop strategies, give you feedback on packaging, even make suggestions on things that are on ingredients or other things that you should be doing that could enhance or grow your brand. Next slide. Um, so now that you know kind of what we're looking for, let's talk about some tangible tactics that you can use when trying to connect with our team. And I did a quick survey of our merchants and thought it would be helpful for me to tell you what they're looking for when it talks about creating a win-win partnership. So let's go to the next slide. When you meet with our teams, provide concise and factual communication. You, you probably could imagine that we have an immense number of suppliers uh, and innovators, entrepreneurs that reach out to us every single day. And so we have to filter through that. And so the more concise and factual your communication is, uh, is gonna be so much better. Be clear and quick about what your product can offer our customers and what makes you unique. And, and I, I can't emphasize that last part enough. Oftentimes I'm asked, what's the best way to get into Whole Foods? And the answer is be unique, be differentiated. Look at what we have on our shelves. And if it's just another of the same product that we already have and another brand, um, that's typically not where we'll lean into. We'll lean into what's unique and differentiated where the customer's going. Um, be sure to keep it factual. While many materials help us get to know you and the story, we might be able to tell our customers, remember that if we decided to bring your product in, we're gonna follow up to ensure that all your claims are true before we onboard your product. And then you should be ready to back up your claims. If you're familiar with our ingredient standards, which I would encourage you if you're gonna come talk to us, you should be very familiar with our ingredient standards and the certifications that we require. Uh, make sure that you can provide that documentation. Um, and certifications or documentations that differ your product help our merchants compare new products against our ingredient list, our customer shopping patterns and industry trends, and they'll ask about certifications for claims like organic, non-GMO, fair trade, biodynamic, uh, you name it. Even things around your agricultural practices, we're going to ask for efforts of what you're doing to reduce your impact on the environment through packaging, you name it. And our customers are interested in all of these areas, so that's why we ask those questions. And then be open to feedback and partnership. This is super important. Um, our team members are, as we said before, are super passionate and are experts in the categories in which they lead. And so it's oftentimes they'll give you feedback on what they, they, about your product, where they think you could do brand extensions, where they don't think you should extend into various different categories. Um, oftentimes willing to come and meet with you in your labs and kitchens and so forth to help co-develop. Um, and so don't be afraid to, to take that feedback. Uh, we've been very successful in helping uh, uh, many, many supplier partners nurture their product, nurture their brands, and think about all of those different facets of how to launch a product. Uh, many times, um, uh, you'll look to us to partner together to fill a need in an assortment, and you may ask us to, again, so develop something, and we'll do that kind of work with you. And then be ready to tell your brand story in active and involved ways. Um, did your brand get it started in some unique way? Uh, do you have a partnership with a charity group? Uh, are you are your production methods innovative? Um, our customers are going to want to know about that. Uh, again, in your mission and your values and whether those are aligned with what our customers are really uh, looking for. And so we'll be looking for how to, to help you tell that story effectively through your communications and through your packaging. And eventually we'll drive customer awareness and education and partnership. This may mean working with our merchant teams along with our marketing operations teams to bring your message to life in materials and online in-store promotions, even in-store signing. And while we've turned off our demo program right now, uh, once we get that back and going, it's a critical way to get your food in the mouths of, of our consumers. And so before I open it up for any questions, I just wanna share just some final thoughts. Um, you know, that we know that the power uh, to change the industry and therefore influence our assortment and the work that we do in developing products really lies with our customer. We take a customer obsessive view first. So whether we create more assortments for special diets like keto or paleo or gluten-free, or help to reduce plastic packaging or examine our environmental impacts, it's on us to create space for innovation and educate customers so that they're able to purchase products that align really with their values. And we're super appreciative of all those who are on this call and all those that uh, I've seen out there that are ones that we've launched product with, that we have developed meaningful relationships with. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have uh, with how to do business with Whole Foods today. With that, I'll turn it back over to to you. All right, Don, thank you. Listen, there are a ton of questions. So uh, are you able to uh, open the Q&A chat, Q&A yeah. discussion, I'm sorry? 
Uh, I think uh, given the time here, we've got a, 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 about 10 to 12 minutes here. I think you should just take them as you see them. Um, one of the questions that came in is uh, understanding the role of Range Me at Whole Foods and how or if the buyers are using the platform. And, and I'll try to feed you a few more, but if you see any, jump right on them. Yeah, uh, we, we, we did an early launch with Range Me when it started, and we have found that we're actually more effective going right into our supplier portal today. So there is a supplier portal. It's a much more effective way to connect with our teams. Uh, we found with Range Me that it was very difficult with the thousands and thousands and thousands of options that that provided uh, for us to use that as an effective tool. And so our, our challenge is to just go directly into our portal. Okay. Um, how should we get into yeah go for it as you see them there's a whole ton <laughs> yeah there's some familiar names like Marilyn Martin too um let's see how would we ought to get in touch with our global team with our deck uh again the same thing is uh, if you go through our, our our portal it'll tell you how to connect with our teams and as you send those uh in those into our teams our teams will review that uh, and will respond uh, be patient um, as you can imagine, they get a whole lot of, of, of uh, emails uh, asking for them to review product. Um, but our commitment is to review those and get back and at least share with you our perspective, whether there's interest or not and so forth. Um, let's see. Boy, these are coming in rapid fire. It's hard to yeah, actually get them all at once. You are getting hammered. You're, um, Carlotta, Carlotta and Nick got off easy, although folks, from, uh, I would do... I reassure you, they got their questions too, so you'll get answers. Yeah, one of the questions, do you have, do you take a successful, unique emerging brands and then move uh, to private label concepts? Um, uh, depends. Um, we actually do obviously review what's happening in the business and determine whether we think uh, that's a concept that eventually we should also offer in our private label. Uh, 365 plays a unique position and more of a value orientation um, uh, often as a, um, a Me Too, there was a brand alternative. Um, we're developing more so in our Whole Foods Market brand, which is for us is our own efforts to be innovative and unique and different to the marketplace. And so we're not intending to knock off, in a sense, uh, another brand that might be out there because otherwise that's just, again, ourselves being Me Too. Um, uh, we, I would say we spend more time just looking at macro trends and so forth than specific brands on how we decide what to launch. Uh, in our own private label. Um, I'm just browsing through some other. Hey, Gary, if you see a question, go ahead while I'm browsing. If you see one. Well, one, one question that there. we've got a bunch of people in this boat is if you're not already in your portal, how do you get in? <laughs> yeah, I'll have to get back to you on the specifics of that. Um, but we just, we really do have a, a, a uh, Whole Foods Market portal that any supplier can access. Um, yeah. Now, it doesn't give you visibility. You don't get to see all of our data that a supplier does once they're in board, but allows you to engage with our merchants and, su and uh, submit a request for, uh, uh, for a meeting for a merchant to reach out to you. Um, so I can put that online. Um, There's a question out there of, of prior to COVID, my product had been approved, but needed certification from Whole Foods Market Meat Department afforded to approve necessary documents, but I've not heard back in a few weeks. I, I would just ask on that one, be patient. As you can imagine, our teams, and particularly that one in Meat, Meat has, has, the comps have been absolutely outrageous and the team has spent their predominant time, including even on non-perishables, no longer focused on, on new products or new suppliers and just getting product into our stores. And in fact, many of our brands are even de-emphasizing new launches, cutting back on some of the items that they have to focus on where they can get the most efficient production. And so uh, if, if you've been struggling to get good uh, feedback or connections with their teams during uh, the COVID pandemic, understand that that's what the teams have been focused on. And as we come out of this a little bit, the teams will have more bandwidth to get back into what is our core differentiators around in innovation. So the teams will get back to you on that. And, and, and actually the review, somebody has asked a question about how COVID has affected your uh, review schedule. And I realize it changes with the department. Yeah, I, I can answer that a little bit. So we're, we are reviewing that. Um, I would say actually just one of the things that we're doing in general is we're doing a SWOT analysis, you know, a strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat analysis of every single category. And as you heard kind of in the pre previous uh, presentations, 
there's a number of things that we expect uh, will happen. One, we're learning from COVID. We had categories that absolutely skyrocketed that we have, are still chasing to get inventory in today. So we're learning from that and understanding how that we are going to be more resilient if there were to be another surge. Uh, we also think because of, of summer camps and lack of travel and vacations and other things being canceled, that this typical summer slump that grocery experiences will not happen. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to see a sustained set of growth, particularly across a lot of our categories where a lot of eating at home, cooking, baking, you name it, will continue to happen throughout the summer. So the, I wouldn't call it pantry loading anymore, but just the elevated growth. Um, you know, there's a there's a set of questions that relate. I understand, to, for example, like. Oh, good. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, there's a set of questions being asked uh, related to uh, qualifying to apply for global. Is there a kind of a rule of thumb? How many regions do you have to be in? Somebody asked, do you have to be in four? Yeah, once once you're in three or more regions. Uh, you become a global uh, supplier. Um, so if you want to start at the smaller level, you'll start with the region and then go to one or two other regions. Once, once you want to go to a fourth, you start working with global and the global will help navigate the expansion of that uh, beyond that. Store openings being pushed back? Um, uh, yes and no. We're still opening stores. Uh, we've con converted some of our store openings into what we call dark stores. We've seen a significant increase in what we call our Wolf, our Hopi's Market online or basically Prime Now business. And because of that, many of you have probably shopped our stores and not had a very pleasant experience as you run into the Amazon uh, sh uh, Prime shoppers who are shopping on behalf of a Prime Now customer. And so we are taking many of our new stores and converting them in the interim into a dark store so that we can improve the experience uh, in the other stores from a customer standpoint. But no, we have every intent to continue to open stores. Um, and uh, we are five, it was funny when you said, you know, we had 12 stores back in 19, in the early 1990s, we're at over 500 mm -hmm. stores now uh, when Gary was getting his start way back then. Oh, we were, we were before Whole Foods. I'm oh, I know, 1983, you were way before we had 12 stores. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don, uh, there's a question about uh, post Amazon acquisition, and I know this is a biggie, but any comment on how Whole Foods standards and culture have changed? Um, I would say the core aspect of our culture uh, has not changed. Um, Amazon, for the most part, has been um, uh, hands off. Uh, obviously, where they've seen uh, Whole Foods to be an a asset or a tool in their own strategy to expand food online. They are leveraging our perishable assortment and our perishable distribution centers and so forth. Um, but no sacrifice whatsoever of our quality standards. Um, in fact, very supportive of the work that we continue to do to advance our quality standards. Um, and while we have evolved, our organizational structures have evolved, we've evolved aspects of how we work. The core culture, the core mission, the purpose um, is as strong as ever. Yeah. Well, this, uh, and it's interesting, Carol Byers, uh, you, you know, you and I had this very good conversation last week, and I was passing along uh, some consistent questions from vendors, large, medium, and small, who've been coming to me. And uh, Carol asked, seems like the opportunity during COVID is to leverage Amazon better. Has management thought about how to do that? In addition, please provide a better platform for early stage brands like a farmer's market online at Amazon that allows you to feature um, new items and also provide trade deals. So, so really maybe uh, this is probably the end of the bombardment for the moment, but maybe a little bit more about how uh, to interface, uh, how we might uh, expect the interface with Whole Foods and Amazon to uh, open up opportunity. Yeah, so I, I would say that we have still not mastered the uh, seamless interconnection in a sense to say, hey, if you talk to us, then we're going to introduce you to the Amazon team and vice versa. That said, if we are if we are talking to a small brand or someone who's just getting their start that we think is too early, we don't think the customer is there yet, and so forth, we, we will encourage uh, the um, Amazon connection, the Amazon marketplace, and can facilitate that connection into the merchant team at Amazon. We can't guarantee that they'll launch it, um, and then we watch it. So if it does launch and it's an early read, we, we get to have it. We get a lot of data from Amazon that we can see and view 
to determine whether we think that has enough viability for us to then launch it back into the store. So there is that type of connection. We do share a lot of data back and forth between our teams. Excellent. Well, look, it's a work in progress for all of us. It's a new world. And honestly, you're taking time uh, to do this for the uh, 400 people who are on today is really appreciated. Um, I, I want to assure the questioners because they were coming in faster than we either of us could even make our mouths work. Uh, Don will be getting all those questions and we will obviously be hoping to um, get you back uh, some answers. And Don is yeah. uh, with us all day tomorrow yeah. as well uh, for the uh, pitch session. I can't thank you enough. It's, uh, it's Thanks, really Jerry. special to have a chance to talk with a major player, major trendsetter. And of course, the back to back with you and the Nick, Nick's and Carlotta's trends is uh, very intentional. Um, we're all dependent on your success as well as uh, vice versa. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. I'll, I'll uh, work on the answers in the Q&A. Okay. That's a work in progress. Uh, thank you, Don. And uh, everybody, including my uh, fellow panelists for the afternoon, uh, stay tuned. We will open up the portal in about three minutes. This is a short time for a, uh, a pee break or a uh, water break. I'll be right back to you. <laughs>